He honore, he krore e kite atua, he maungarongo ki te whenua, he whakaro pai ki ngā tangata katoa, ti hei wā Māori ora. Hoi anō e ngā rangatira, a tēnei te mihi atu ki a koutou, i kaue mai nei tēnei a tātou, kaupapa i te ata nei, anō reira, a nau mai, a nau mai, a whakatau mai. He kōrero hoki ki te kāngo rungarawa te tīmata me te hakamutungo ngā mea katoa, a nāna i o homa e mana e tango atu, nō reira, tēnā koe e pā. Tēnā koe e pā, ko taipai tātou i tēnei wā, te whakanui ake tēnei o ngā kōrero i mui a mātou, nō reira, a tēnā koe. A me tika, he whakaro hoki ki a rātou ko a whetūrangi tia. A haere, haere, a moe atūra. Haere atūra ki tērā taha o te arai kaue hoki mai i wainui a mātou, te hunga ore he whakararu i a mātou, nō reira, e ngā rangatira o tēnā marae, o tēnā marae, ngā rangatira o te wiki, o te marama, o te tau, haere, a haere, a moe atūra, a kāti. A tātou te kanui oro i huhui mai nei i raru i te maru o tēnei kaupapa, nau mai, nau mai, a tauti mai. A tēnei te mihi atu ki a koe te rangatira, a te kani, Nga hau i kawe mai tēnei a tātou kaupapa i mui a mātou, ka tū koe ki te kōrero ki te iwi i hui hui mai nei e pāne ki tēnei kaupapa ngā pua wai tanga o ngā whānau. Hei kōrero e pāne ki ngā huarahi tika a me ki te oranga o tātou nei te iwi Māori. Nō reire tēnei te mihi atu ki a koe, mō tō kaha, mō tō maia, Te kawe mai tēnei a tātou kaupapa e i mua i te iwi. Nō reira, kei te harikoa mātou, ko tai mai koe, me tēnei a tātou rangahau i mua i a mātou. Nō reira, tēnei te mihi atu ki a koe a te kani. A huri nō huri nō ki a koutou, nō tēnā iwi, nō tēnā iwi, nō tēnā tari kāwanatanga, nō tēnā tari kāwanatanga, tēnei te mihi hoki ki a koutou. Kā reo e kumea a kei tēnei kōreo. Ka tū tēnei a mokopuna nō tainui me ngā tuki me te whaure a waka, hei whakatau i a koutou i tēnei wā, hei mihi ki a tātou nei rangatira me te kaupapo te rā nei. Nō reire e ngā rangatira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, kia ora tātou katoa. Good morning and welcome. My name is Donovan Clark. I'm the Chief Advisor Māori at Subaru. Um, and it's a pleasure to have a full house and a pleasure to see so many familiar faces here today to listen to uh, Professor uh, Te Kani Kingi talk today. Uh, tēnei te mihi atu ki a koutou. Anō reira, he honoro tēnei hei tū hei mihi atu ki tēnei a tātou rangatira i te atane. It's a pleasure um, for me to stand here and to uh, welcome our speaker this morning, Professor Te Kani Kingi. Uh, te Kani is of Ngāti Pūkeko, Ngāti Awa, uh, Ngaitai descent. He is an Associate Professor and Director of Māori at Massey University here in Wellington and is a specialist interest in mental health research, psychometrics and Māori health. He's also a Keen Warriors fan and a Hurricanes fan, <laughs> as we've spoken about this morning. But it's a real coup that we've been able to secure Te Kani's services and come along and talking about Te Pā Harakeke and this awesome <coughs> money that he's been uh, a part of over, over uh, recent years. So I'm not going to talk for too much more. I'm going to hand the rākau over to um, Professor Te Kani and Kōrero. Nō reira, kia koutou katoa, nō mai whakatou mai, 
tēnā koutou, a tēnā koutou, kia ora tātou katoa. A tēnā koutou, a kanu te mihi atu ki a koutou katoa, a ki a koe he hoa, a kanu te mihi atu ki a koe mō tō tō kupu, hei whakatau i a tātou, hei whakamahana te ruma nei, nō reira, tēnei te mihi atu ki a koe, ki a koe hoki, a kahu, a kanu te mihi atu ki a koe mō tō i nō e mai ki au, ki tā ramai ki konei, ki te kauhautia i mua i te aro aro i a koutou, Ara ki a whakapuaki, taku whakaaro e pāna ki tā mātou rangauhau, ara a te pā harakiki. Nō reira kare, te hihi ki te whakapuhau, pō reire a tō koutou taringa. Engari, ka tika katsu, ka mihi ki a koutou katoa. Ara hoki ki te haukainga, i mihi tēnei ki a rātou, hei tāwharau. I a tātou, i rungi tēnei rā, i rarui tēnei kaupapa huki. Kā tika huki, ki a mihi atu ki a rātou, kua wehe atu ki te tua te rai. Nō reira, mui mai, mui mai, mui mai rātou. Nō reira, nō, kā rei te kūmero te kōrero. Ngari, kei te tino harikoa hau ki te tū, ki te kite te mātou toru o koutou, kua tai mai ki te whakarongo ki tēnei rangahau. Nō reira, a tēnā koutou, a tēnā koutou, a tēnā rau koutou katoa. Well, kia ora, and thank you for providing me with an opportunity to speak this morning. I was told I've got 30 minutes, so I'll try to keep to that 30 minutes. And Donovan, thank you for the very... Very warm welcome, warm introduction. Um, not too sure how accurate it was, uh, but like I always said, uh, say after an introduction like that, um, you know, even I'm looking forward to hearing myself speak. Um, what I'll be talking about is um, a project that uh, myself and a number of others have been involved with. Uh, about two or three years now, and uh, it comes under the Te Pā Harakeke program, and it's a project that um, we call uh, Te Pua Waitanga o Ngā Whānau, Markers of Flourishing uh, Whānau. Now, uh, Donovan mentioned in the, uh, my introduction, I've got interest in but my actual backgrounds in, in mental health and in psychometrics, I and mean, maybe we talk about uh, flourishing uh, within the context of, of whānau, people always ask the obvious question, what do you mean by flourishing? Uh, the definition of flourishing that we use in this research project is actually derived from uh, our work and experience within the mental health sector. Any mental health people here? Uh, better watch myself now. <laughs> That's right, Philippa. Good to see you again. Um, and there's a model that, uh, actually I'll get Philippa to help me out if I get it wrong. The mental health sector's been using a while to describe the notion of, of flourishing, and what it actually means. And here's the model they, they use. You see at the top there's flourishing, which is a good place to be. And at the bottom, uh, languishing, uh, which is a less positive place to be. And the assumption's been in, in mental health for, for a while now that um, people that are, uh, that are suffering from a mental health uh, problem, they're naturally sitting in that uh, quadrant there. They've got mental health symptoms, uh, so by proxy, uh, they're in, in a, uh, a languishing state. Uh, so the objectives of treatment, you get rid of the, uh, the symptoms, and the person automatically moves into that state. It sort of makes sense, eh? I'll see if I can, I wonder if I can back that up a bit again. I just wanted people to show people that again because that took me three hours last night to get that to <laughs> so, so let's just all take time and pause and wonder in amazement. 
you I might finish the presentation there on a high. Um, but anyway, that, that, that was the assumption. That was the assumption. Uh, but uh, what they found was that that often happened. And anyone that works in the, in the, in the health sector know that they're quite often getting rid of the symptoms of illness and disease is, is, is quite easy. You've got a sore toe, well, if you chop the foot off, the symptom's gone. Uh, but it's not, not, not always a good outcome. But they found that uh, you get rid of the symptoms, but the individual's still languishing. And that got them to thinking a bit more. And the other thing that they noticed would happen was you quite often get people that have symptoms of mental illness, but actually not feeling too bad. Okay, feeling, um, you know, feeling okay. Uh, then clinicians, any clinicians in here? Oh, good, I'll let rip. <laughs> uh, then clinicians get their hands on them. And uh, yep, no symptoms, uh, you've got symptoms of mental illness, you're feeling not too bad, you're flourishing, uh, you get treatment and care, and this is what happens. <laughs> feel worse. Now I was working in Porirua Hospital a while ago, I got to thinking about this, and, uh, and I asked the question, how, how could this, um, this happen? I was talking to, to a person that had... Uh, not saying this is a healthy state to be in, uh, but had a mental health problem, was hearing voices, uh, but wasn't feeling too bad about themselves, uh, but got, uh, was receiving treatment and care, a um, lot of medication. Uh, medications got rid of the voices, uh, but it also meant that they put on a considerable amount of weight. Uh, they dribbled every time they tried to eat, uh, loss of libido, uh, loss of relationships. So actually, uh, previously, before treatment, they were feeling uh, better. And I, I followed that up uh, with them, you know, what's been the main, main, uh, main difference? I said, well, at least when I was hearing voices, I had someone to talk to. <laughs> That's what they said. Uh, but it actually moved them to a state where the symptoms were gone, uh, but there was a whole range of other side effects that impacted on their health and well-being, which meant that they moved from a state of flourishing uh, to a state of languishing, in spite of the fact that the symptoms uh, had been reduced. So this got the mental health sector thinking, uh, and this is not news to, to a lot of people, I see Karen there as well, to try and understand uh, what those components were there with the question markers. What, uh, where could you, um, how can you move people to a, to a place uh, where they're both flourishing and no mental health symptoms? And what they found was it was more than just about symptom ablation. Uh, and what mattered to uh, service users, consumers, and tangata whaiora, yes, having no symptoms, uh, but also what mattered in terms of their mental health and well-being and which enabled them to flourish was to have a meaningful job, was to have a home, was to um, have a meaningful relationship uh, intimately with someone and with their family. All those types of things that you couldn't really quantify that weren't really the responsibility to a large extent of mental health service providers but were fundamental to enable them to flourish. And that's a broad uh, background to the notion of flourishing at least within the, um, in the mental health sector has probably done the most work on flourishing. Now if we transpose that, uh, uh, this idea uh, of flourishing to a, uh, a family context, there's the broad uh, definition. People always ask what's the definition of, of flourishing. This is the one that we use. Uh, families that are vibrant, resilient, <coughs> nurturing, and I like uh, the, uh, you can always tell if a family's flourishing, the last bit's important, where they're optimistic about the future. It's nothing like a bit of optimism. And a lot of different definitions around flourishing. That's broadly the definition that we used um, with this research project, which is ongoing, by the way. And I'll get into that a bit, uh, a bit later. See if we're on time. 
Now, in terms of uh, markers of flourishing uh, families, uh, this is largely based on research and some um, key person interviews, which some people in this room were involved with. Um, fairly common sense. Um, families are able to flourish if they're economically secure, if they're cohesive, uh, if the environment within the family is safe, they have good relationships with others, they're independent, and that last bit, aspirational. Again, looking forward to the future with enthusiasm and optimism. What we were wondering was whether or not there's a difference between uh, flourishing families and flourishing whānau. Um, and in the end, we, 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 we found that uh, it kind of worked like that. Is that yes, there, there are some new, there are some characteristics to flourishing, uh, which are unique to Māori. Actually, they may not be so unique to Māori if I reflect on them in greater detail. Uh, but there's a huge amount of overlap between um, what you would conventionally consider to be uh, uh, flourishing markers and what Māori would see. But there are some key differences. Uh, six key differences that we identified in our research project um, that I'll go through uh, shortly. The six are whānau heritage, whānau wealth, whānau capacities, whānau cohesion, whānau connectedness and whānau resilience. And I'll probably just spend about 15 minutes just describing those. So the first uh, First one there, the first marker of flourishing whānau. <coughs> whānau will flourish when they're strengthened by a distinctive heritage. We talk about whakapapa here, uh, access to cultural skills and knowledge, uh, to customary land, uh, whānau tāonga and associations with Māori, uh, associations with Māori institutions. Um, hopefully all these resonate with people and they can see the importance of culture uh, to the promotion of a positive whānau environment. The key here is to be careful how they're interpreted and again um, this is all based on, on uh, conversations, interviews and the literature. It deliberately say their access to cultural skills and knowledge it doesn't necessarily mean that every woman in the whānau have to be fluent or native speakers of te reo Māori. Um, I think only about 11% of Māori actually can speak Māori well. Uh, and those figures are dodgy anyway because they're all based on self-report. And if you're like me, you probably over-exaggerate your level of fluency. If you've had a couple of beers, even more so. <laughs> But only 11% of Māori speak uh, Māori well. Um, so the emphasis here is having access to people within the whānau, within the extended whānau, that can provide that cultural uh, support um, and the type of access to knowledge. Speak there about uh, whānau links to customary land. We call ourselves tangata whenua, but there's actually plenty of tangata without whenua. And particularly with our, our demographic um, changes in our demography, and Māori in particular, uh, most Māori know that they've got land, and every Māori will tell you that they've got lots and lots of land. And what they won't tell you is that there's lots and lots of owners, and they can't tell you exactly where their particular <laughs> sharers of that land. Um, but just having access to customary land um, or at least knowing uh, that you have land somewhere uh, is reasonably important to um, uh, this notion of flourishing. Having access to whānau taonga, uh, maybe in Urupa. Um, historically, all whānau had taonga. Um, one of the challenges, I guess, in a, tempor a contemporary environment is that uh, as whānau have um, grown and expanded. Uh, now there are many whānau that may not um, necessarily have 
um, access to Taonga. Uh, sometimes it gets passed down one land, uh, one line, and all that does is alienate other Fano members. And my family uh, grandparents uh, recently passed away. Had quite a bit of Taonga. Uh, strangely, my my Fano made the wise decision uh, to actually let the museum hold our Fano Taonga. So if there's a tangi, a wedding, or a graduation. The museum has it there, and anyone that wants access to it uh, can uh, access our Fano Taonga. The risk is, is that if it gets passed down one uh, line, you know what our people are like, it goes in the closet and doesn't come out again, only for their Fano. Um, so having that sort of access is important. Um, associations with Māori institutions. Um, now, what I'm, I'm not talking and, and aroha mai, I'm not talking about runanga or iwi in particular, uh, because we know that 25% of the Māori population live, I think 80% live in, or more than 80% live in the North Island, and 25% of all Māori live in Auckland, and large numbers of those may have tenuous connections to uh, the traditional tribal uh, entities and structures. However, they may still strongly relate to this notion of being Māori. So again, interpreting this that bottom uh, bullet point, the association with Māori institutions, isn't about associations with iwi or runanga, it's about associations with Māori entities or institutions. It may be te whānau or in an urban setting. It may be a Māori cultural group it may be a waka ama group, but they're all Māori groups. And for me, in Aroha Mai Neville, it may be the St. Stephen's Old Boys Association. <laughs> <laughs> My old Hato Petra friend over there. Um, but the emphasis there is placed on an association with a Māori entity, whatever that might be. And it really reflects on the notion of diverse Māori realities and that not all Māori are the same, nor will all Māori have the same view as to how they're able to embrace their culture. You may not necessarily uh, embrace your culture by going back to your iwi, by going back to your marae, and in fact only 34% of Māori in the past 12 months, the statistics tell it, anyone from States New Zealand? Very good. You can see them staring at me and scratching their heads. According to the Te Kupinga study, Kia ora, I just, just you. Uh, only 34% of Māori would have gone back to the ancestral marae, in, uh, I think in a 12 month uh, period. Um, but the other, the encouraging um, thing was that 80% of Māori knew their iwi, and I think about 70% of Māori think that it's important to be involved in things Māori. So that's a really, um, that's a really uh, good indication as to the importance of, uh, of whānau, family connections and whanaungatanga. And if I'm not mistaken, I think, I, can, uh, I think States New Zealand will be putting out a paper shortly which shows that whanaungatanga, or family connections, have a stronger relationship to life satisfaction or well-being for Māori than income or health status. Is that reasonably correct? <coughs> Good, I'm getting a nod. Uh, which is an interesting fact. Especially when thinking about my whānau, it might have the opposite effect. Uh, but the point they made within the Kupinga study was that those that had stronger family connections um, had greater uh, life satisfaction. <coughs> and I really like, and I wanted to promote this work that States New Zealand are doing because it, it really quantifies the relationship between whanaungatanga and health and well-being. It's not just that someone said so, it's actually the data tells us that. So if anyone questions you on whanaungatanga and it's important to importance uh, to Māori, uh, we have some very good evidence to, um, uh, to highlight that fact. So that's the uh, first bit, uh, whānau heritage. 
Now, the second marker relates to the fact that uh, um, men and women cannot live on whakapapa alone. <laughs> and for, for a number of Māori whānau, the, the, while they're enthusiastic and passionate about uh, things Māori, Māori culture, tikanga, reo, for, for vast majority of them, they've got uh, other pressures, which are large, putting food on the table. We should never forget that uh, income also plays a huge role in terms of allowing families to flourish and uh, to grow. Um, having access to whānau assets like lands, buildings and shares, I don't know what sort of whānau that might be, certainly not mine. Um, whānau incomes and reserves uh, most whānau have incomes at some point coming in from somewhere. But the biggest challenge we found was this, the, the, the second point about fa uh, whānau financial reserves. Income's fine, it's reserves which are almost zero. Uh, the problem that causes is that if anything happens untowards within the whānau, there is no capacity within the whānau to deal with that issue. Um, I interviewed someone as part of this project and they told me how terrified they were to get a warrant for their car. Um, and they often drove around without a warrant and a rego. Not because they were keen on breaking the law, uh, quite the opposite actually, uh, but the mere fact that if they took their car in to get a warrant and there was any kind of bill associated with that, just couldn't deal with it. So what do you do when you've got children? You've got uh, errands and chores. Uh, you have to break the law. Not because you want to or you're a bad person or deliberately trying to do that, just you have insufficient financial reserves to deal with any hump that comes along the, on, on the road. Um, so incomes and whānau reserves. Uh, I probably can't, should stress a bit that the... the um, I don't know what someone was asking, Mason. Actually, someone said to me uh, one time, well, you know, um, um, money, wealth creation, and finances, it's not really a Māori thing. And my response is, well, maybe it should be. <laughs> and, uh, it may, and I don't know where people get that idea from, because if you look at all our historical texts, uh, you look at when... Uh, guys like Joseph Banks who came across with James Cook in the late 1700s um, and a guy called Lydiard who wrote a lot about Māori during the 1800s. The clear impression they give us is that Māori were extremely industrious, um, keen on business. Māori bought their own ships in the 1800s, were involved in international trade uh, well into the early 1800s. Um, and were described as an extremely industrious people. And in fact, you look at the old Waitangi Tribunal um, reports, particularly around the fisheries claims, um, you could see that Māori, even prior to European um, uh, contact, uh, were doing a huge amount of commercial trading between iwi and between tribes. So this whole idea that we're, we're not keen on making money or on businesses or wealth creation uh, is clearly flawed. It's something we, should, we need to, uh, to look at because it does have a huge impact on education, on housing. Uh, the National Health Committee re released a report a few years ago that said the number one determinant of health, not the only determinant, but the number one determinant of health was income. So wealth is also a good marker of uh, a flourishing whānau. Third uh, bit there, uh, whānau will flourish when they have the capacity to fully participate uh, in society. Really about, uh, this mark is about positive engagement with the, um, with the wider uh, community. Um, not feeling isolated or not feeling isolated, you, 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 
you may have relationships within your family, within your household, and I'm using family and household interchangeably here, but unless your family or household is able to develop positive relationships with your wider community and embrace the wider community, that isn't always going to allow your family uh, to flourish. Um, and to celebrate things, educational, sporting achievement, um, mentioned a bit there about feeling part of the community. Some families have been part, part of communities for, for a long time but don't actually, they've been living within the community for a while but don't actually feel part of the community. Um, embracing society, not being overwhelmed for it, overwhelmed by it. Uh, the thing about employment too I want to touch on is that um, it's often the points often made that employment's important. Uh, I would add <coughs> to that that meaningful employment is important. Uh, it shouldn't be employment uh, that um, is insufficiently that you're insufficiently compensated for, or employment uh, that's boring and mundane, or uh, employment that's dangerous. So, the thing about employment, it needs to be. Uh, meaningful and employment also provides a pathway whereby you're you're able to engage other people and the other and um, other parts of the community we also know that um, from a health perspective um, it's important that whānau are able to model uh, positive uh, lifestyles where do we get most of our health information from uh, it isn't the, anyone even the Ministry of Health. I'll let rip. Um, it's not from the Ministry of Health. It's not from our GPs. It's not from our health promotion workers. Although they, they all do a fabulous and fantastic job, most of our health behaviours are modelled uh, by our families and our parents. And it's important uh, that we use those mechanisms to actually promote health and well-being. In 18, or oh sorry, in 1915, the major threats to Māori health, things like influenza, measles, goiter, uh, tuberculosis, diphtheria, 100 years since, those issues are no longer a major threat to Māori health and development. What we're seeing nowadays are things like mental illness, uh, cancers, uh, heart disease, uh, obesity, diabetes. Uh, what's the main difference there? Lifestyles and entirely preventable and respond positively to health promotion and health education. So there's huge amounts of gains to be made uh, for Māori health and development by there's other issues, of course, but by modifying unhealthy uh, behaviours. Um, and that's an opportunity for whānau uh, to actually play a major role in that process. A couple more to go. Whānau will flourish when they're cohesive, practice whanaungatanga and able to foster positive intergenerational transfers. <coughs> Here we're talking about um, this is less about whānau structure, it, 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 it's about, um, and the, we've struggled with this a bit because the other um, markers that we've identified have been fairly easy to, or we think we can measure and quantify. This may be the most important aspect of a flourishing whānau, it's about the quality of relationships that exist within the Fano, but how do you actually measure that? How do you measure at a high level? How do you gather data which suggests that that uh, that Fano is functioning well within uh, that environment? How do you um, better understand that there's good quality relationships within the Fano? That people are respectful to each other? That the environment's nurturing and positive? And I wanted to make the point here is that what we're talking and what we found clearly that it's not about the composition of the whānau, it's about the quality of relationships that exist between those whānau members. So it matters little if it's 
Um, it would be an unhealthy environment where you've got mum, dad and 2.5 kids and a white picket fence if mum and dad are always fighting. Uh, they don't love the children, they don't care what they do and they, they basically just let them run feral. It would be much healthier, uh, for example, if it's a single mum or a single dad or two dads or two mums and the environment was nurturing, positive, loving and helpful <clears throat> and that allows whānau to flourish. So the point I want to make there is it's not about composition, it's about the quality of the relationships that exist within those, um, those whānau. Um, positive whānau leadership, it's always a difficult one. Sometimes it's the loudest person that gets heard. Um, it should be the most considered person that should lead the whānau. Um, holding whānau events and participation uh, in those, involvement in whānau traditions, and I'm not uh, speaking about uh, cultural traditions necessarily, but each of you will have things that you do within your whānau that you look forward to and that you, uh, that you embrace and which strengthens the whānau. And having those types of traditions is certainly important. A biggie there is, um, the third point there, opportunities for whānau living elsewhere to participate in whānau life. If we think of whānau, Māori whānau anyway, in the broadest uh, sense, uh, it's not just about the household, uh, but it's about others within your whānau. Large numbers of Māori um, do not live in their traditional uh, tribal areas. Um, and you can't always get back for um, Fano events, important cultural events. You can't always get back to the marae as we've seen. You can't always travel back for tangi. So how do you create opportunities for those living outside of those uh, traditional areas to be involved in um, uh, traditional activities? It might be a tangi, wedding, 21st can be extremely difficult. We know that almost 20%, almost one in five Māori live overseas. Okay, 160,000, thank you. About 140,000 about live in Australia. So how do you, what, what do you just, just cut them out of the equation? Or do you provide opportunities for them to um, uh, participate in whānau life? There was a, um, um, apparently this, there's this thing going around called Facebook <laughs> and uh, a few years ago, or a couple of years ago, there, there was a, uh, someone was holding, and, and it's quite popular nowadays, holding a, a there was a tangi and a, a large number of the whānau of the person that had passed away were living in, um, living in London, uh, they couldn't get back certainly couldn't get back in time. Uh, so the, they made an arrangement where they'd set up a, uh, a webcam. I think they call it Cyber Tangi. <laughs> cyber Tangi, yeah, got, got new words for it. Uh, so that the um, uh, people overseas that are part of the whānau could engage. And I was talking to a couple of my friends about this. Um, the jury's still out on whether or not it, it's appropriate or not. One of my friends was um, staunchly in favour favor it. He said, look, if they can't uh, um, get back, it's, it's, it's a reasonable use of technology that allows them to engage. Another one of my friends was staunchly against it. He said, um, the point is, isn't to make it easier. The point is that it is hard to get back. And that's what, uh, that's what matters. Um, so they were arguing backwards and forwards. And um, in the end, my, my friend that was against it said, well, he said, at the end of the day, you can't send your wairua down the internet. Um, and my other mate responded and said, well, you can if you've got broadband. <laughs>
But anyway, creating those types of opportunities for whānau cohesion allows them to flourish, a a according to our, um, our framework at least. Um, I'll finish up fairly quickly. I know I'm running out of time. Um, whānau will flourish uh, when their connections beyond the whānau lead to empowerment. Um, this, this harks back to a previous marker, uh, but it goes into a bit more detail about whānau and families being able to participate in their communities, the ability to contribute to the community and to guide uh, <coughs> its development, to have some sort of power and control of uh, their community or within their community, exercising citizenship rights, uh, contributing to community boards, voluntary efforts, all those types of things. Not feeling isolated or powerless or just an independent island um, by themselves within their community, but actually there's nothing more um, it can, and if, if Philip, I know we discussed this uh, years ago with, uh, with mental health treatment and care. But people don't just want to receive treatment and care. They want to feel as if they're offering something back to their community, and that's important for their health and well-being. If we transpose that to a, the setting here, it's about providing Fana with the opportunity to feel as if they're making a difference and contributing to the lives of others and their community. Uh, the last marker, and I'd better quickly, um, things don't uh, always go to plan, and quite often they don't go um, according to plan. So the, the last marker is around whānau resilience, and it's the ability, flourishing whānau must have the ability to be resilient and that is to encounter adversity and to overcome it. Uh, what allows you to do that? Uh, the research uh, suggests that if you've got experience of adversity, if you've got cultural security, financial resources, information and education, that builds resilience. Um, the main thing here is that resilience needs to be part of this um, flourishing uh, whānau conversation because it's not always going to be roses uh, but if a family is resilient a speed bump along the road will remain a speed bump it won't turn into a mountain that you can't climb and unfortunately there are some families which hit uh, that mountain and just stop Good. Well, I'll quickly move on. These are the six uh, markers. Markers of flourishing, whānau heritage, whānau wealth, whānau capacities, cohesion, connectedness and resilience. Uh, what we'll be doing, what we'll be undertaking in the next uh, few months is looking at if we, and, and they're not perfect, the markers, <coughs> but we'll be um, undertaking some research shortly to see what the social, cultural, economic circumstances of uh, Māori Fano are. So how well do they match the ideal, at least in our minds, and uh, Stats New Zealand and others are helping us with that work. Uh, but the end game is to look at transformative uh, pathways. So if this is the ideal, this is where Māori currently sit. Uh, what are the transformative pathways that can shift, potentially shift Māori from a languishing uh, to a flourishing state? Understanding that not all Māori are in a languishing state, uh, but for those that are, and according to our framework, uh, what strategies can be put in place to actually move them along uh, that continuum? And apparently Mason's working on that now, so I'll leave any questions around that for him. No reira, ko mitsu taku kōrero, he mihi anō ki a koutou katoa. No reira, a tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. Kāna mi te mihi atu ki a koutou katoa. Kia ora.